This program offers three different ways to engage with a Sherlock Holmes short story. In part one, author Philip Ridley shares his passion for Sherlock Holmes as a reader and as a writer. In part two, guide Corinna Marlowe gives us a flavor of life in Holmes's London. In part three, TV director Simon Kethlen Jones storyboards the climactic scene in the Red-Headed League. And at the end, we include Granada TV's version of the same scene. But first, Philip Ridley, well-known author of Crindle Cracks and Mighty Fizz Chiller, tells us why the Sherlock Holmes stories have fascinated him since he was a boy. Now, the first thing I started to read were the Marvel comics, but then I wanted something that was a bridge between reading the comics and reading a full-length novel. And the thing that I found and fell in love with immediately were the short stories of Sherlock Holmes. They were the perfect length. I had called upon my friend, Mr Sherlock Holmes, one day in the autumn of last year and found him in deep conversation with a very stout, florid-faced, elderly gentleman with fiery red hair. I didn't know Victorian London. I didn't know half the words that he was referring to, but it was, it was like science fiction. I could grab a dictionary and I could investigate this world like it was a completely new territory. To the Red-Headed League. On account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, USA, there is now another vacancy open. In a way, the language of the short stories worked on me like poetry works on me. It created feelings inside me, and it was the feelings that were important. He curled himself up in his chair, with his thin knees drawn up to his hawk-like nose, and there he sat with his eyes closed and his black clay pipe thrusting out like the bill of some strange bird. The Sherlock Holmes stories follow a convention, which I suppose you could say is the convention of classic detective fiction. And that convention is a kind of three-act structure. Act one, somebody comes into Sherlock Holmes and says, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, I I've got this puzzle. This is it. Can you tell me what's going on? Mr. Jabez Wilson here has been good enough to call upon me this morning and to begin a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular which I have listened to for some time. Act two is that Holmes goes out and does a bit of investigating, usually with Watson hanging along and holding things up. We travelled by the underground as far as Aldersgate, and a short walk took us to Saxe Coburg Square, the scene of the singular story which we had listened to in the morning. Act three is that Holmes settles down and says, all is revealed, this is the answer to the puzzle. And how could you tell that they would make their attempt tonight? I asked. Well, when they closed their league offices, that was a sign that they cared no longer about Mr Jabez Wilson's presence. Holmes represents the new. He is heading the way into the 20th century. Forensic science, logic. Holmes fell upon his knees upon the floor, and with the lantern and a magnifying lens, began to examine minutely the cracks between the stones. Watson, on the other hand, is looking back. Watson's looking back longingly into fog, into mystery, into the potential for ghosts. There's lots of modern equivalents in this relationship between Holmes and Watson. In Star Trek, you see it between Captain Kirk and Spock. Spock is Holmes. You reasoned it out beautifully, I exclaimed in unfeigned admiration. It is so long a chain, and yet every link rings true. It saved me from ennui, he answered, yawning. The stories of Sherlock Holmes are written in the first person singular, which means that we are seeing everything through the eyes of Dr Watson. It's like when you do one of those drawings when you're joining up the dots, and you sometimes join them up correctly, but usually, because they've been given to you in a certain way, you join them incorrectly. I had seen what he had seen. And yet from his words, it was evident that he saw clearly not only what had happened, but what was about to happen. Even though we say that the Sherlock Holmes short stories are detective novels, the real detective work goes into what we find out about Sherlock Holmes. He is the most intriguing thing about these short stories. It's like gradually peeling away layer and layer of an onion. And that is the magic of Arthur Conan Doyle. He is the quintessential, the perfect storyteller. So what was the world of Sherlock Holmes like, and how does it compare with today? Original London Walks guide, Corinna Marlowe, gives us a brief insight into Victorian London. So here we are in the Strand, very busy nowadays, and just as busy in Sherlock Holmes's time. Nowadays, you can see that the street is clogged up with cars, taxis, and buses. And in Sherlock Holmes's day, there would have been buses as well, but pulled by horses and the hackney carriages and cabs would have been horse-drawn too. So the streets would have been very noisy with the wheels going on the cobbles. 
the streets would be full of mud and dung and little street sweeper boys would come to sweep the street clean. Nowadays, of course, we all have mobile phones to talk to each other and the internet to send emails. In Sherlock Holmes's day, lots of Sherlock Holmes's clients get in touch with him by sending him a telegram. Or you might even hire a messenger boy to take a letter to the other side of town. So now we step towards the gaslit alleys of Victorian London. So here we are below one of the many gas lamps that are still in the streets of London. We can imagine just a little pool of light below, darkness between Holmes and Watson running through here, their coattails flapping to chase some criminal. The fog, of course, is a major character in lots of the stories. Coal fires created a horrible, filthy smoke, and sometimes you could hardly see across the street. Holmes is extremely clever. But the sort of people who went into the police force at those days were not necessarily. It was rated as being an unskilled labourer. So here we are at Rules Restaurant, the oldest restaurant in London. In Sherlock Holmes's day, the upper classes would have eaten here, perhaps the well-off middle classes. And if you were a clerk, you might come here for a special occasion with your best girl. In those days, the class system was very carefully defined, but nowadays it's much more to do with money. You could very easily tell what class people came from by the clothes that they wore. An upper-class gentleman, for example, wouldn't be seen out without his silk top hat. And nowadays, you can't really tell when you see somebody walking down the street whether they're upper-class, middle-class, lower-class, rich or poor. Next, Simon Kethlin jones director of Sherlock Holmes and the case of the silk stocking, takes us through a six-frame storyboard of the bank vault scene in the Red-Headed League. The bank vault, that's always been a scene I'd love to film. You've got Holmes and Watson and also um, Merriweather, the bank manager, and Jones, the policeman, holding, holding up in there, waiting for the criminals to come in. They've been tunnelling from the pawnbroker at the back of the bank. You've got all sorts of tension. It's in the middle of the night. You've got guns. You've got time ticking past. This criminal could well be a killer. I placed my revolver cocked upon the top of the wooden case behind which I crouched. Holmes shot the slide across the front of his lantern and left us in pitch darkness. All right, well, let's do the storyboard. I am really bad at drawing. And, in fact, that doesn't matter at all because it's not, it's not how these pictures look. It's really what the pictures are that you can see in your head. OK, so the first shot is the sort of wide shot, showing the geography, showing where our characters are and maybe getting a sense of what kind of location this is. The boxes of money. Holmes here with his hat. And there's Watson. The, the story says it's very, very dark. And of course, you must be loyal to the story when you do these things. But you can take little bits of license as well, because you need to see what's going on. Then you want a bit of lighting. So what I do is I do a sort of funny little window up here, maybe. And you've got some light that comes in through there, just to give a gloomy sense. Then I'd have some tense music. Gloomy lighting and very still. They have but one retreat, whispered Holmes. That is back through the house into saxe coburg Square. I hope that you have done what I asked you, Jones. The second and third pictures for me would be there to establish the characters. And the second one would be a shot of Holmes and Watson. So the second shot here, that is very, very big close-up of Sherlock Holmes, so we can see into his face. And in the background, you've got Dr. Watson here. Not quite as big in frame, because he's less important than Holmes, but he is very important. He's there with his gun, ready to save the situation if required. And you could perhaps just start to hear the breathing, and maybe you just see very, very slight movement. My hearing was so acute that I could not only hear the gentle breathing of my companions, but I could distinguish the deeper, heavier in-breath of the bulky Jones. For me, the third shot would be of the other two characters, Jones and Merriweather. It wouldn't need to be as close as on, the other, on our two heroes, because they're not as important. Merriweather and Jones. Maybe it's sort of from Holmes's point of view. And we can also maybe show the floor. This is going to become very, very important because just here is where they're going to dig through it. And remember, we've still got the gold Napoleons uh, in all these boxes. You've got to imagine that looks like thousands and thousands of dollar bills or pound notes or whatever. It's a lot of cash. The 
From my position, I could look over the case in the direction of the floor. Suddenly, my eyes caught the glint of a light. If you set things up now, it's time to deliver. And so the fourth shot needs to be, OK, guys, something's really happening now. What I'd do is I'd have quite a big close-up of the stone floor. And it just looks like a completely boring shot until suddenly you hear this scratching sound and you see a little chink of light and that, that finger of light runs along the mortar and then it ends up being really, really bright. And what you'd also do is you'd have the scratching noise at first could interrupt the breathing sounds so you know that something's happening before you see the light. With a rending, tearing sound, one of the broad white stones turned over upon its side. For me, the fifth shot would be to show the real action. We've seen the close-up of this light coming through. What I'd do is I'd have a higher, wider shot looking down. I'd see all our four heroes, um, and then I'd also see, in much wider shot, the uh, chink of light and then the stone being pulled out. That's Holmes here, and then you've got our other guys there. It starts off still and quiet, then suddenly the stone gets pulled away and we see John Clay starting to scramble through the tiny hole. And that's where the light blazes up. And it should look very dramatic. These guys have been working really hard, scraping away. Maybe they can have heavy breathing. And the music here should change a little bit. It should increase the tension because something big is about to happen. In another instant, he stood at the side of the hole and was hauling after him a companion, lithe and small like himself, with a pale face and a shock of very red hair. The final shot, you'd see the hand come out and then you'd see John Clay come out thinking he's safe. And it's very important for the tension, I think, there that he thinks he's made it. He thinks he's made his million. During the action, Holmes is the man. He is the star and you've got to see stuff through his eyes. And this is a picture of our two criminals, one of them is actually out of the hole, that's John Clay, and he's pulling up his colleague coming out here, and this is the guy with the red hair, that's to symbolise red hair, and what I'd do is I'd freeze this shot just at the very moment when the two guys realised they'd been caught, and that would, that would sort of have a real sort of punch to it. So with this one, the light continues, the musical climax, and possibly we would freeze the frame and don't forget the red-headed man. And here is the same scene from Granada TV's version of the Red-Headed League, starring Jeremy Brett as Holmes. Jump! 